Hello everyone, good evening and welcome today. Um, good evening, good evening. Just looking out to people who are on the call. Good to see you once again for this final edition. Can you believe it guys? We have come to the end. Um, Some people can unmute themselves. Those are, um, are you a co-host? You're a co-host, you can unmute yourself, right? Yes, you're a co-host. Okay, great. Um, yes, would you believe it? It's been since April and um, I don't even know how this started. And here we are, I'm so, I'm, I'm, Thank you. Thank you to everybody. I said today there's one or two names that I want to give a special shout out. And I want to do that at the beginning so they get their shout out before we don't know what will happen um, later on. And maybe I'll shout, give them the shout out at the beginning and then give it again at the end because I mean, why not? They deserve, they deserve it. Um, thank you. Um, so special mention, in case they're not here, let them know. I wanted to just thank Olanle and Ruki, they were my first panelists or guests on this. Thank you so much for being the first. You know, the time at the time I was like, oh no, I'm going to get people. I'm like, who's going to agree to do this? And they agreed. Thank you, thank you, ladies, for setting the pace and just getting it going. Thank you to Evan. And uh, Evan is the one person that reached out and said, I really want to do it. I really want to do it. And I was like, okay. Uh, okay, I like the enthusiasm, but he's not here today. Thank you to Coach Lillian and to Maya, who isn't here. Maya, um, David, who isn't here. Uju and Ugo, thank you, ladies. Power, I was about to say power couple, not power couple, power sisters, fire sisters. Um, Soya Day, who isn't here, and uh, Chinaya, who isn't here, to Kelechi. And thank you to Itunuade and Shola, who have been before and they are back again. They had it so good last time, they thought I have to come back. So I am so deeply appreciative. And if you have if you have, have had to do this with us, you will understand. While I'll be grateful, they understand what it requires. Just taking the time and um, to go through the reading and to make sense of it and to sift it and to pray and come and present and, sh and just share your heart. So I really appreciate it. But I want to say another thank you to Rookie. Rookie has been silently advertising this book review. Every single month, she's advertising it. I look up and I'm like, ah, Rookie is there. I don't need to bother. Rookie would put the word out there. She's constantly selling us. So thank you so much, Rookie. I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you, DB, for giving us the opportunity it was just a wimp and you were like oh no I think I mean I think I found that with DB anytime I suggest something it's, it's not a good idea because <laughs> I should learn not to make suggestions to him he always accepts it and says so how are you going to <laughs> like that's not what I meant I meant I'm seeding my contribution like my, my contribution is to seed the idea and somebody else We'll run with it and fly with it, but if that has not been the case, so I'm kind of rethinking that, um, providing ideas and suggestion things. So um, welcome to this very last one. Today we're, I think today we're talking about a man from Ghana named Samson Opong, was born Kwame Opong, and um, he later changed his name to, to, to Samson Opong. We're going to go, it's a short story, and I hope to keep it I hope that we can keep the story short so we can do like a recap of all of the 14 persons that we've talked about and also get your thoughts and feedback. I, I encourage you, I plead with you in the name of God. Today of all days, you will please unmute yourself, ask questions or share your thoughts. Type in the chat, that's good. We take it, but also, you know, we're recording this, so it'll be good to just hear you. And we want to hear your voice. It's, we want to just hear you. So even your disagreements, honestly, it's, it's allowed. Anybody that's done this review knows that I'm very open. Bring your uh, uh, disagreements and just share it. And let's, because it, that it's in seeing different viewpoints that we all get to 
we all got get to learn. So that wasn't supposed to be my opening. My opening was going to it was taken off from the song that was singing. Um, the song that said, um, "What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus." I was I, I was reflecting on that song and I was thinking, yes, the name of Jesus is the reason for this book review. It is the one thing that I want everybody, I personally want us all to take away from all of this book reviews, Jesus, the man, Jesus, the person, Jesus, and everything that he signifies, he stands for, what, what, um, everything that his message embodies. It is because of Jesus that we are here. We're celebrating the Lordship of Jesus. We're seeing Jesus's footprint in Africa from the 1800s. We're seeing how, you know, all that he did then affects us today. We are here because of Jesus. And the song said, okay, uh, what a powerful name. Nothing can stand against it. And um, I, I, I thought about that again. I said, this is so true. You see, I think... Um, I don't know who wrote it in the Gospels that um, the church of God, I'm paraphrasing, the church of God marches on, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That is exactly what we see working out in this book, uh, this review. We're seeing people of different backgrounds, different characters, different personalities, most especially different faults, different shortcomings. And God chooses to use all of us, the way that we are, mad and all. And uh, he uses us whether we want to be used or we don't want to be used. There's uh, something that DB says, uh, I think I've shared this before. He asked a question, he asked me a question two years ago. He said, who really wanted Jesus killed? At that time, I just thought, you know, I had the answer. You know, it wasn't this, it wasn't that. Oh no, it was the Pharisees. Or was it the Pharisees? Was it really the Roman? and was it satan yes it was satan satan was working through them and he was like no it was actually his father it was god <laughs> you know <laughs> and you know it's like god wanted him killed and god thought i need my son killed for a reason how can i achieve this i know i know i will go to the people who hate us the most or he hates him the most and just see the idea to him and they'll be so excited. I'll drop them breadcrumbs and they think, oh, great. I've got him now. I've got him now. Meanwhile, Father God and Jesus are there laughing. Thank you for helping us. And that's what I find. That's what I've come to find that whether or not all that we do in everything that we do, whatever creed, religion, language we ascribe to, everything about our lives helps to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether we stand in opposition, we tear it down, we pull it down, we discredit all the miracles, we discredit the name of Jesus, we say there's no God, if there's a God, or we stand surrender to it, or we stand in the middle, fair weather, whatever works for me. We, we, do, we are not able to stop the move of God. We're not able to quench what God wants to do because God is greater than that. But my prayer for all of us is that we will willingly choose to align with it, to embrace it, to surrender to it, and to say, Jesus, I love you. I love your work, and I am surrendered totally. I give my life to further your work. I give my life for your glory. That's what I pray that everybody, that we all come to. Some people, I hear this prayer, you know, Lord, anything that will not, anything that's bad for me, if this thing is not going to work out, if it's bad for me, if it's not for your glory, don't let me enter. Don't even let the offer come. Don't let me. And I've prayed that prayer. And I know we prayed. There's a place for it. But I, thinking more recently, I said to myself, actually, there's a higher level. There's a more mature prayer to pray. You know, you're, that one we're asking God, you know what, we'll block the options. Don't let me have to make a decision. You know, just make the decision. Give me one straight path. But I find that God actually wants us to come to crossroads and have to make a decision, make a choice. We choose him. We choose the path that is less traveled. We choose the path that of more resistance, not the path of less resist resistance. The path that is, we choose him. He wants us to choose him all the time in everything and through our difficulties. And um, so that's what's 
that's my original opening speech before the thanks, but all of them can be opening speech. <laughs> all of them will go for opening speech today. So welcome Shola and Etunua Day. Great to have you. I'm so pleased that you're closing out with me and I'm grateful that you, you agreed and you're willing and I know you have other things to be doing. Um, um, DB is typing out a message, so if you can read it, do go ahead and read it. I can't actually read everything he's saying. So I know that these two ladies have other things to do, maybe with their spouses or with their family, eating turkey and things like that, I'm not mentioning names, but, but they gave it up. And I, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for it. So we'll jump in and um, start to talk about Samson Opong. And I want to start with Shaws, my dear friend Shola, the author starts and he talks about um, in this story, he starts by giving us, as he does sometimes, giving us some kind of background or telling us some stories about what's happening in, in the community or in the country, in the nation um, prior to or just about the things that just wet the ground, set the pace for, for the story that's about to unfold. And he did it in this particular instance do you care to just uh, share with us what you glean from that sure i will i i hope everyone can hear me well we can hear um, you i'll do my best to give a summary um i'm not quite a history teacher so forgive me if it's not exact but the setting of uh samsung upon is in ghana is with the ashanti tribe and it was actually quite interesting. I actually do enjoy the fact that the author gives us the context um, during which these revivalists emerge. And so similar to most of West Africa, the Ashanti peoples were tribalists. They worshipped idols. But the interesting thing about them is that they're one of the indigenous peoples that did very well to resist the British for quite a while. They were known as a warrior tribe. Um, and they covered Ghana, Togo, and Cote d'Ivoire in their heyday. Um, it says here that the Ashantis are a subgroup of the Akan-speaking peoples. Um, and their name, Ashanti, is derived from Asante, which, is, which means because of war. So they were renowned warriors. And um, before the British, they actually were actively trading with Europeans. They traded, in, they, they traded in slaves, they traded in materials um, in exchange for weapons, which was then used to fend off the British for a long time. Um, they had a symbol, one of the symbols of their, of their idols was a golden stool. Um, and this stool was worth mentioning because this was a point of, this was a significant point of contention between the Ashantis and the British. So it's said of the golden stool, it's made of gold, um, and it is said that it could never touch the earth. Um, and if it's ever put on the ground, it was on elephant skin. Such was how they revered the golden stool. And when war broke out between the British, um, the first time that the British overcame the Ashantis, they wanted to capture, they, they demanded as part of tributes, the golden stool. And you know, to, to, to put it in simple terms, it touched them. It touched them deeply. <laughs> There's no other way to describe it, but it's, it's, it's hit a button that said, it's, it's, you know, it's like, it's bad enough that you conquered us. You now want this thing. It's like, oh, no. They were riled up. And another amazing aspect of this story is that they were led by the mother of the king. The king had been captured and imprisoned, but his mother... Nanaya Ashantewa was the woman who riled up the peoples and said, these people will never capture our golden stool and actually pushed back the British. The, the British governor um, at the time faced significant defeat and shame because not only were you defeated by the natives, but by, by natives led woman. by a woman. <laughs> it's double shame in that, if you think about the context of that time, it was double shame. So. It was actually quite fascinating, um, but it also sets, I don't want to spend too long on the history, uh, Robbie, if you don't mind, but I think what I want to highlight is that these were warrior people. They were proud people. 
Um, there were also, it was also a society that clearly women could lead. Um, but this, this hold on this their idol, the golden stool is, is symbolic of how they saw, of how I think that they saw the white people as coming in as colonizers and made them even more resistant to Christianity. So the author also shares that they were resistant. Yes, the Catholics could come in and set up a church, but they didn't have many members and they didn't penetrate their shanty tribe. The, the, the Christians were, were, were more successful in the South with the Fantis and so on and so forth. Their shanties are in the Kumasi region, which I believe is Northern. Don't quote me on that, but I believe it's in the Northern part of Ghana. Um, and they, they, they struggled the, and, and um, Samson Opong emerged under the Wesleyan mission, which is Methodists. Um, at some point, Robbie, you're going to have to help us as Catholics, as Methodists, that all these people that are coming into Africa, um, <laughs> we have to understand, understand all the differences in, yeah. in, in, in our, in our a, Christian expression. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I mean, I just wanted to highlight that the way in which the British came um, made it, created a double resistance to Christianity. Um, they resented their, their conquerors. And they didn't want anything to do with them. Fine, you want to conquer us, fine. You want to pillage us, fine. But we don't want your culture. We don't want, we don't want anything that is like you. This is who we are. We're a warrior tribe. Um, our, our pride has been affected. So we're not going to, we did, they didn't embrace British culture. They didn't embrace the, the British faith. Um, until one of their own, one of their own emerged on the scene and emerged with power. Um, and I don't want to give too much away, um, but I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to highlight. No, 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 that's, that's actually good. That's a great point, place to stop before, you know, you tell it all. <laughs> but thank you, thank you. That was beautifully done, Shola. And there's something you, you, you said, and I wanted to just, um, share some of my thoughts on that and some of the yeah thoughts and conversations I've had with people in the past and where I rest on some of it. You know, we have this within the Christian circle and people who are in other circles, whatever they call the circle, you know, people that I can say they identify strongly as believers and people who don't, there is this narrative that Religion is a white man's thing. Christianity um, was brought to us by the white man. And I can see, we can easily see why that, um, that miss, that information or that, um, that mindset exists. Because really and truly, the Europeans spread the gospel. The Europeans, especially in Africa, they brought... Um, the gospel, either the Spanish and French Catholics or the English Anglican. And I don't know where Methodists came from. You're right. We do need to look at all of these different divides and how they came into, came into Africa. So African people, the original African people associated, because it's the person that brought it, they associate, this is your religion. This is your God. But, um, and, uh, and I know a friend of mine who's, um, who lives in the UK, her son said to her um, just a few weeks ago, her son said something to her, but mom, you know that Christianity is a white man's religion or something like that. And she stopped dead in her track. And then she called me and said, Robs, this boy is saying this. I don't agree with him. And I know that you have, you can, you have the details. Tell me, what should I be saying to him? That was really funny. But Christianity is not a white man's religion. It is not. Christianity started in Israel. Well, what we call Christianity, there's a name we give it, started in Israel, which is in the Middle East. It's an offshoot of Judaism and eventually um, spread. It spread from due to, mostly due to persecution, it spread from Israel to all the other places where you know, it spread because of migration uh, from Israel to all the other places where the Jews were. So Christianity was first to the Jews. Then Paul came on the scene and it started to go to, because Paul was not received very well by the Jews, he started to go to the Gentiles. And, um, and that was really Middle East and he went to Rome and Rome, because Rome was a ruling power at the time, they were the world power at the time, he went to Rome. And it was in Rome and from Rome that 
they were most persecuted and spread. <laughs> Going back to my earlier comment about you can't stop, you can't stop the gospel of Jesus from spreading. You cannot stop. You cannot stand against, you, you cannot stop the work of God from moving forward. The Romans for years, century after century, killed off in very horrible ways those who protest, um, profess to be Christians. They accused them of um, cannibalism, that they ate flesh and they drank blood. They accused them of sexual orgies because they have this love feast that they do. They accused them of uh, having another king rebelling against the emperor. Um, is that what it's called? Roman emperor, yeah. Um, accused them of re rebelling against him and claiming that there's another God that they serve. And this is not, the emperor wasn't their king. They can't serve Rome. So of course, anybody would, you know, any ruler would, will call you, you are being, uh, what's the word now? Not a traitor. Traitor, there's another word for it. So that's some of the, um, that's some of what happens in the, I've had, incidentally, I've been looking into this from the early um, hundreds up until just the movement and the spread of the gospel. So for anybody who has a misconception or some kind of doubt, treason, thank you, treason, yeah, is treasonable often. Um, anybody, let me let you know, Christianity is an offshoot of Judaism, started in Israel and spread in the Middle East before it was years later, maybe by the year 300 and something, it was late 300s into 400s before it got to Europe as we know it. It got into the France and England. So by that time, you know, yes, Shola says we have threads coming into Africa. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. So at the, in the early hundreds and two hundreds, when Christianity was spreading, Christianity was already in Africa. In fact, before that, when Philip had encountered the um, Ethiopian eunuch, who is, Ethiopia is in Africa, which means he was an African. And he wasn't even just the first. There were the accounts of people across Northern Africa because those were Northern Africa. That's what we have an account of who had met the Lord Jesus, who were saved. Christianity was here first before it got even to Europe, I dare say. Um, but, you know, there was break in transmission. God is reviving that and has been reviving that. Um, so I wanted to just let you, let you on that bit of information that the gospel is not a white man's religion. Don't accept anytime you hear somebody say that, just take time to educate them because it's miseducation. And um, we can see why they're misinformed about that. We thank God that we have the privilege of knowing the truth about this. So we go back into our story. Shola has set the scene of what was happening in um, Ghana at the time before it became Ghana, the Gold Coast, all the fight and the struggle with con colonialism. And we're familiar with it because it's, it was, it's right across in the 14 characters we've looked at. It's the same story playing out in maybe in with cultural context um, for each of the each of the location. Thank you, Shola, for that. <laughs> um, so back into our story, let's go and meet Samson Opong. We know that his parents were slaves. So he, he too was born a slave. Um, and I have no idea what that would have been like. Because slavery was not our time. It's not something that I, I can really relate to or any of us can relate to. And we thank God. Um, we thank God for that, that we can't relate to. But he, his parents were slaves, and then he was born a slave. And his father married many wives. I think his mom would have been maybe the first or second. I'm not quite sure now. But there was another wife who was a free woman. Apparently back then, if you married a free woman, someone who was born free, it elevates your status. I mean, it makes sense. It elevates your status and your standing in society and opens doors for you. Um, so that's what happened. I um, want to just over to Itinoade to give us some insights on Samson upon himself, his early days. 
before what was uh, where was he born what's what were his early days before we actually start to look at um his journey into his long journey <laughs> into christianity You need to unmute yourself. You haven't unmuted. Unmute yourself. Oh. Hey, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, so I had my hands free on. Let me try oh. that again, because... Can you still hear me? Can hear you, yes. Okay, very good. So... Um, I was saying that I found it very interesting that um, his father, even though he was a slave, he had three wives, you know, and that he was able to marry into, marry a free woman. And um, actually, it talks about um, the fact that um, it was this marriage that he, the father had to this free woman, you know, was a blessing for the father. But later on, that marriage became an issue for Samson because um, there, was a, there was a relative um, of his stepmother, of Samson's stepmother, the brother, who was a traditional healer. He was a fetish man and he was a magician. And um, from the early childhood of Sam, um, Sapong, what happened was that um, this man um was you know he, he liked him and was the one that got him introduced into magic and medicine and um the fetish the fetish way of life and um he talked about the fact that as he grew older as as um sam sap 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 song um grew older at that time actually he was born kwame so he was Kwame Opong, way until he met with the Lord. So, Tunode, as, Tunode, yes. do you mind? Can I stop you? Can I stop you? Um, I believe the author of the book that we're discussing is in the room. So Yay! I want to just, we just want to just stop and uh, recognize him. Yes, please. Before we, we carry on. It just only seems fitting. Right. Yes, so, DB, um, over to you. Does DB have co? Post. Yes, right. Oh, there you are. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And I really People, we can barely hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Okay. Thank you so much, Ravi. Thank you for your selflessness and everyone joining from every part of the world. <laughs> uh, Shola from the US, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, Jumoke, US, happy Thanksgiving. I don't mention your name from wherever you are. <laughs> Please forgive me. Everything I knew about the fathers came down to this author. He is my father. I'm so blessed and happy to have him in my mind. I knew I was born with great heritage, but meeting him in my lifetime opened me up to the wells of the fathers to know that um, our revival here in Africa wasn't from Azusa. It was from God. Jesus came to Africa. He was here for two years. He stepped on this place. So he had some, you know, some things drop here. And afterwards, we had other people out there talking about them. But this man has used a considerable amount of his lifetime, of his resources, everything, with or without support, to push the works of the fathers together. He has done this selflessly many times. I've been with him. I've learned from his feet, and I'm still learning at his feet. Um, I always say in my heart that even if I don't receive anything from him again in my life, what he has given to me is more than enough. Everywhere I go, this now has, has, has christened me. This is who I'm becoming. People are beginning to see that I represent the spirit of the fathers. And I'm very, very proud to uh, 
help push their work. And by extension, most importantly, help push the work of this father of faith that I'm introducing right now. Um, it's many things to me, and I will stop here, but I will like him to just say, you know, even if it is two minutes, you know, uh, um, he was he was not supposed to be here. He he, he was saddled with uh, a lot of national uh, issues and responsibilities by God, and he told me that I, I shouldn't just worry. I should carry on. But then he, he, he changed his mind again. Um, I'm so blessed to have him here. Um, it's so wonderful and very rare to have him, you know, here. <laughs> so I'm speaking of no other than my own father, Reverend Moses Pudilidu. If you can hear me, sir. Daniel Bello. <laughs> Sir. Oh, have we lost? Has it fallen off? If you can hear me, sir. Hello, can sir. you hear me? Very well now. I can hear you. Good okay, evening, thank you. Sir. Thank you. So good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening, okay. sir. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to be your miss today. Uh, I think I had some time ago that there is a review of this book going on. And uh, I've read, uh, I think, one or two of your past reviews. This is great. I'm really happy that this kind of thing has been promoted. And uh, I've always encouraged uh, Christian uh, to be in the habit of reading. Uh, more than anybody, more than any faith, more than any religion, the Christian is supposed to be the most learned. The Christian is supposed to be the most informed. Uh, because you could practice any other religion without necessarily, but not so much with Christian religion. You see, it's, imp it's important because even our faith is connected with the book, which is the Bible. So I'm so honored to be your miss tonight. Of course, it's been, I've been very busy. Okay, I would have loved to participate in all your, in all your reviews, and it is great. The essence of learning all these stories is uh, people complain today about Christianity. People complain today about modern preachers, modern pastors, bishops, general overseers, and so on. The reason is because one problem I found is in, in Nigeria, is especially is this. A lot of the people who are complaining about this ministry or that ministry, they themselves, they don't understand the problem. Okay? They don't understand. It is true. They are only reacting against an effect because they don't understand the disease. They don't understand what is wrong with the church because they don't even know the history themselves. Okay, and I've taken this issue with uh, some of our, some of the famous people in church in the ministry, okay, about the importance of history. I've had to take this and take some pastors, take some bishops, okay, up on some of these things. The fact that we need to invest because your theology cannot be right and sound if your history is wrong. This is one lesson Christians have not understood, and which I'm trying to. Uh, bring to the front burner of religious discourse in this nation at this time. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, we're working on some other ones. We've been made, we've made with challenges. Uh, Daniel Bello is is, uh, is aware of uh, of some of these challenges that I've had to fight alone. I've had to sacrifice everything, everything, a fruitful career. And I'm a chartered engineer. Okay, I've had to sacrifice everything, but I'm happy about it, that at least Africa today has this. Okay, I was in America in 2015, and everywhere I went, I was honored because they have read the seminaries, their university, they have my books. They've read them, so I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm happy about that, that at least today, 
a, a, a Nigerian, a black man too can rise up and say, look, your father did not teach our father. Our father too, we have a, we have a history. We know something about God. I'm happy about be able to stay because there is a world press conference we are having tomorrow okay in connection with the national issue going on in nigeria which i'm going to deliver so i uh, uh, the little time i can stay with you just bear with me before i go it just so happy that uh, all these things are coming at the same time thank you very much i really appreciate it. thank you thank you thank you very much Thank you very much, sir. We're so happy to have you. DB, are you there? Yes, I am. I am. I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for everything. We are grateful. Um, Roberta Okereke has been the one um, at the front gonna pushing this uh, forward. She started in March, and she will bring all of us together to review this book. Um, and by and large, people started joining her as well in the review. Olushola uh, Adiola uh, has been here twice or three times to support her in the work. Itunwa um, uh, also has been here twice, and these are people that they just felt so drawn to the book. The book has been um, of tremendous blessing. Madam Lillian, Coach Lillian also has been here. And so we thank you so much. For me, it's, it's, it's uh, part of my dream come true that I will uh, bring Baba to this world, but not, not today, because I will still bring him back again. And he will, you know, he, he, will, he will have all of the time. I need him to have nothing less than you know, seven hours <laughs> broken down into two, two, two hours or three hours. And, you know, I really need that from him, but he's so, so, so busy. And I know that one of these days we would have, we would have him here. So it's a, it's a privilege having him here. My joy, my desire is that all of his works, all of Baba's works will be recognized globally. That children of God will begin to read true stories, not, uh, not just fictions. They'll begin to see the raw power of God. And, and, and people will have ideas from there, those that want to make it into books, those that want to make it into movies, those that want to put it on Netflix, wherever, so that we will take it everywhere. And we also will have history that three generations down the line, if they Google Babalola, they will see the genuine stories coming out. If they will mm. anything, they will see the genuine stuff coming out so that we too we will not just have this book scanty and all of that. And I met with Robbie in 2019. This was how we started. I started talking about the fathers and she was looking at me, at me like I dropped from somewhere. And it was like, no, these things are not true. <laughs> DB, yes. You have to be making these things up. So I, I said, well, no problem. I will then begin to introduce you to So that was how I started introducing, bringing the first book and you know, telling how the things that I learned myself from um, at his feet and the things I learned also while growing up uh, because I, I, my whole life is, is, is into this. This is my heritage, this is where I'm from. This is what describes me. So Robbie, I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for what you've done. This is the final um, um, review. I really hope that it's, we, have, we have not come to the end of it, but this is it. And sorry for taking your time. I just needed to do this. <laughs> thank you. No, it, it, was, it, was, it was right that you should. Thank you, DB, for that. I think he's dropped off now. I know some people had some wanted to ask him questions, and I was going to just let us ask him the questions but he's dropped off. If he comes back again, we will pause because uh, just to honor his time and we'll just pause and um, maybe take, take the questions that we have because um, he's a busy man, as he has said it, he's, he's in the middle of engagement. So um, and we'll just give him that time. And we'll, while we continue to plan for an opportunity to meet with him in person and have, you know, one of um have a uh, conversations with with him in the future. So okay, so oh I think he's come back on now. 
Right. DB, do you want to um, anchor the questions or should I do that? Ah, no, I think you should go ahead and do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right, sir. Welcome back. We noticed you dropped off. Can you hear me now? DB, do you want to reach out to him, see if he can hear? I no, can hear yes, you. I can, can hear you. Can hear you. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Sir, please, um, while we, the few minutes we have you, some people would like to ask their questions, express their, their, their feelings towards the experience they've had or even the gift of this book, and also to ask their questions. I hope you don't mind if we take a few minutes of your time right now. Please, hey, no problem. No issue. Okay. That's okay. Okay, right. Uh, so if, uh, if you want to ask a question, please, could you raise your hand so I can see you? I will start with Itunu Ade. Um, Tunu, do you want to start first? I believe you have a question or comments or thoughts. No, you have not unmuted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, can hear you now. Go on. Okay. So, sir, I just wanted to start by saying thank you so much, sir, for this book. One of the things that this book has done for me is that it has shown me um, that God is able to reach you, as reach us as, as a people. And that it's, he doesn't have to go through people to reach us because he, he, you know, the idea that had been given to us was that oh, it came, the Europeans brought Christianity to us and they, they were the ones that brought it and then we accepted from them. But what you have shown from this book, from the truth that you have presented here, showed that even when they were here, that God met with these men and women who are the, the, the generals here. He met with them individually and they encountered him by themselves and then they were empowered by him. And they went ahead to do things that even the Europeans could not have done. And I'm so grateful to you, sir, for giving us that light because it has, it has done something. I read the story, Robbie will smile when I say this, I read the story of the person I love the most in this book is Simon Kibangu. And I love the way, <laughs> I know Shola, you are smiling, I know. <laughs> I love, I'm grateful to you, sir, for the way you presented the story. I see how balanced you try to be, presenting their strengths and their weaknesses. You did not cover up. You, you, you were as objective as possible. Where they failed, you were able to put it there that they failed. Where they succeeded, the things that they did, you were able to put it there. And I mean, Simon Kibango's story for me showed um, the way that they could, that a man, if following the pattern of Jesus, could accomplish so much. And I just wanted to thank, sir. Within a short time. Within a short time, yes. Within a short time, and you know, I was, I was just, I'm, I'm just so grateful. I don't really have a question. I just, I just wanted you to know, sir, that what you have done here with this book. I know there. Are, I mean, I'm sure that I'm praying that there are other um, volumes that have other stories of other people. I really hope that you would do that, but. This one that you have done, it has, it has shown us a lot of truths and it has helped us to understand that God can meet with us as individuals. And for that, I want to say a big thank you. God bless you, sir. Ah, uh, thank you. Okay, a point of correction quickly. Please, every time you want to thank, please thank God. Thank God, thank God, not me. Oh. Eh? Aha, uh -huh. please thank God. Okay, I'm just an instrument. I thank you. Please, all right. <laughs> all right, thank you, sir. We have iPhone. Oh, uh, person's name is not there, just says iPhone. iPhone, you've been unmuted. Can you um share your thoughts? Ask your question. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Olu George. I'm con I'm logging in from Cape Town, South Africa. Um Brother Moses Oludele who used to be one of our mentors in UCU. Wow. When I heard he was going to be on this uh, Zoom, I had to just come in. I'm currently 
broadcasting live from a radio studio but i came out of the studio to quickly say good evening oh, sir oh wow thank you so much baba how are you my brother <laughs> yes sir sir how please you, i sent you a brother? private message sir i would like to have your your number i sent you my whatsapp number okay i will check it i will check and reply why you are one of my brethren in uni learning e learning yes, where everything is up yeah e learning is what god yes sir and i so apologize to everyone for badging in like this please forgive no, me no no no, no 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 you're welcome, welcome. no you're very welcome <laughs> all right thank you for that thank, thank you so you very much that. i'm very grateful that's oh that's so heartwarming thank you you okay who else has a question a comment um shola do you want to say something well i mean um it's it's an honor to have you on 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 this session sir and and uh, db please so that's that seven hour session i'm i'm the first to attend i'm register i'm i'm clocking in my registration now <laughs> because i have i have so many questions and i don't want to inundate you but i think where i would just start is with this if we wanted to learn more or read more because as i read about each person my appetite i it's like i want to know more even as we're looking at uh, samson upon i want to know i want to i want to understand more you know we, we were having when we we're preparing for this session we had so many questions about okay what happened after after his fall what, what was the rest of his life like um where can we go to learn more about other african revivalists where can we get credible because you know the the other value of this book is that it is well researched and it is credible you're not presenting one sided information you're presenting balanced information and you have source materials um that we didn't even know existed much more that they are available um if you can mention journals if you can mention other articles other publications where can we go to just to just enrich ourselves where else can we go to find out more information about about african revivalists okay thank you very much the sad thing i will tell you today the sad thing is that uh, africa has not invested so much on its on our own history it is sad it's really sad uh, and that's the reason why when i started this research and i went to our own university i could find nothing there because there no one has done anything on these people so they had nothing if you see anything today you see i had any thesis in like university today about some of them, about some of our nigerian people either babala or any of those they are quoting me go and check it go to any of your university they are quoting me you see Uh, there is this fraud too much so much now in our which they call scholarship today and i used to reproach them that this is no longer scholarship you don't have scholarship again okay because somebody says is doing a is that is doing a, a a bachelor's degree at the end of the day he came to buy some of my books and that's all that's that's all they try to put them together and uh, it's so sad so if you want to do uh you have to a lot of doing some research you know now i discovered that south africa has done much in their own area ghana too is very good it's only nigeria that i think a bit is behind because when you talk about it, there are still so many prophet mighty prophet that have not done they have studies have been done their research is concluded but for me to be able to have that time to sit down to write their to write their story you get the thing you know the challenges now in those days my children were so small you know i could leave mother and child travel for weeks on the side travel out of nigeria you get it now it's a different story you get it uh, so is there are still several people that you have not heard mighty prophet you have not even had their name at all okay in my from my study from my research okay but uh, if you persist you know well, let's pray that god will make a way for some of these other ones to to be published okay i'm aware that at least ghana has done i mean has done considerably okay uh, nigeria well we are, we are we are catching up but about some of these past people 
especially those ones who have done. Uh, look at this one person you all know. You all know about Badari. At least you must have heard of him in your lifetime. When you either went as kids or whatever, you must have heard of uh, Tio or Badari. That's a vast, one mighty prophet that so many people have not. Uh, CSC has tried to reduce. I'm sorry to say that. Okay, there's another man called Timothy Uyanda. You might not have heard. These were mighty diverse man to use a helicopter in this nation to distribute drugs. Okay, mm. in this nation, there are several other people like that. Now, the, pro the trouble I used to have with university today, the problem, and it is a problem. Oh, has it dropped off? Hello, Baba. Network issues. Let's see if he comes back yeah. on. Someone is writing that he couldn't find the book uh, on Amazon. I need to say that Baba is not <laughs> on <laughs> Amazon just yet. We will get there. He has been making quite a lot of attempts and that will that will come out very well very right he's just being careful so you will you will get it for now we can we can find a way to send to you just let us know and have your details we'll send it to you yeah um okay let's see see if he comes back on No sir, no sir is saying ebook and audio book. <laughs> I, I think no, it's too far. <laughs> no, 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 no. He's not taking it too far. He's actually right on course. We're getting there. We will get there. Amen. We'll get there. Yeah. We're not there yet, but we're we're definitely getting there. So um, because it needs to be easier to spread. Many people from different places are, you know, asking for it. And uh we need to keep with the times. Okay, he hasn't come back on. I agree, we need to keep with the times. <laughs> I pray. We do. Um, okay. He hasn't come back on. All right, what do we do? Should we just continue and watch let, out for him? Or? Let, let's let's carry on. I, I will I will contact him right away. Okay, please do he, contact I'm, him. I'm, I'm sure he will come. And yeah, okay, so while we're just waiting for him, we we don't have to go into the book itself, um, so we don't interrupt. We do, don't have that break um, interruption, but we can talk about some of the responses that he has given. I mean, let's. I would like to take your reactions or your thoughts to what you have heard him say so far in response in respect to documenting. Um, our history, our Christian history, and documenting it as Itunu Ade mentioned objectively, being able to tell the truth, the facts of what um, of what happened, and also just the struggle with it, where we are, where we find ourselves. He mentioned something interesting about he was in America in 2015, and his work. Maybe not particularly this one. I don't know if it's particularly this one, but some of his work was recognized. The value that his work um, brings um, is recognized. But I, I don't know. I speak for myself. If I had not met DB, I would have still been like, what, what, what is, who, who's that? There's no recognition for a lot of that. And maybe there's no value being placed. I'm just um i'm musing these are my thoughts anybody has any thoughts or contributions to make along this um regarding these yes i i believe strongly that god is bringing us all together to do something about this in whatever capacity we can i believe strongly that this story is a collective story we can find ourselves in it it gives us strength it gives us power so if you are you know, there and you feel the urge to, you know, make, you know, audio book and all of that. I, I think Baba is, should be open to such. Um, Baba wants every Christian to be, to be informed. Okay. If there is any gift, the greatest gift that Baba can give to anybody today is book. 
um, I've had access to all his books. I've had access to, I mean, quite a lot, a lot chunk of his uh, library. If you get to his library, I dare say that you will be lost in the library. He, he, he's so, you know, when I met Fab, when I, I have quite a lot of, you know, the old sages, but with Baba, it was different for me because, you know, with, with the normal sages that I meet, it's either they are praying for you or you are listening to the, to the scriptures. With Baba, you do script, you start from books. You go to the Bible, you go to books. You have to, it's a, you know, it's so, so, you know, so rich, Baba is so rich with quite a lot of this. And it's just my heart desire that before he dies, all of the research work that he has done, both the physical document that was that were handed over to him and the, the researches that he made about most of these people can be known uh, globally. Baba is yeah. one person I know that he was not commissioned by any church he was not commissioned by any organization, so he did not twist the history. Okay, I Before was from I the breed, yes, from the breed that I came. I heard quite a lot of stories that were twisted, but when I met him, he straightened them out with evidence. He showed me this is the truth. So this is the kind of research that we need in Africa. This is the kind of work that needs to be pushed forward. It's not a work that one was paid to. Uh, paid for or an organization or a church yes. just wanted to he just had to bring it out and Baba went deeply is the only person in my own lifetime that I've seen that has gone into controversial ends that most churches didn't want to go <laughs> about history to take it away from them and to tell them this was not true this was not true and honestly if God is putting it in your mind to push it forward audiobook whatever please keep in touch please um, reach out to us yes reach out for that person that is saying how can he get the book in the uk just drop your details we will get drop back it. to you yeah, we'll get back. okay thank you db um baba is back on the call so we'll go back to the questions or comments and responses um anybody else have any thoughts anything they want to say or share anybody else Okay, if there's nobody else, then I'm going to. Sir, do you have any other final words that you want to share with us? I don't think there's any more questions. Oh. Yes, you were finished. You were saying something before you got cut off. Can you please just finish what you were saying before you got cut off? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes. I, don't, I don't know what caught uh, the... So I was making a statement in respect to that question of that lead. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the issue, the trouble today is that your university cannot help you much in this regard. Uh, most of this research has been funded by individuals who have been out of sea, okay, to document something for posterity. Okay, and uh, I have what Bill said just now, that is true. I have done quite some research and I hope to put all these things in books before I pass on, so that the generation, I've had some story. I've met actual people who participated, who saw certain things. And I'm the last link, as far as I know, between oh. these people and the, and the future generation. I see your, yours as future generation, okay? I have the link between this and the best thing, the essential is for me to put this thing and yes. put them in a record format and what have you, so that uh, we're through you if you get to other generations. Okay? So Africa has history. Okay? It's just that we have not paid the price. Okay? And uh, we have not uh, supported those people who actually, like I used to say, most of what we make, a lot of the noise we make in Christianity today. They are not. They are not the real, the real core, the real essential. So, but it's well. We're going to make. I'm happy that at least is this message is getting to the younger generation. Okay. So a, a new religion will be born. It all begins when God laying hand with somebody. If you remember, the reformation began with somebody discovering a book, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Somebody discovering a book. Every information begins with that. Somebody discovering one book somewhere that has been talked away. Uh -huh. So the record must still be there. So one day, somebody, a child is coming, who will open that book, and then changes, changes. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Okay. The e -book, you, the e book too is also now available. Yay. Okay. Yes. The e, the PDS is available. Uh, if uh, although it's slightly because I we know. know we know Nigerians we want to <laughs> Nigerians may like to get it. So the price will be slightly higher than the hard book. Okay, to discourage pilots and things like that. Okay, so but it's available. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And just before you go, uh, just um, I know you said we shouldn't thank you, we should thank God, but we thank you for yielding, being a vessel that thank God, you. God needed a vessel and you yielded. And that teaches us something. So it's not just in giving us the book, but also teaching us what to prioritize, what to make important in, in our lives. And it, it is always good. I think that's part of what we're learning through the books of how people who have surrendered themselves and they have made it, um, huge sacrifices on their lives for the cause of the gospel. And it's great to know that we know somebody who is alive in our time, in our generation, who is also modeling after that. So it isn't a story of people from way back then. It should be constantly living and it'd be one generation passing on. I'm such a believer in mantles and passing on from gener um, from one generation, passing on to some another generation, passing on to another generation. I think that the, there should be that strong continuity in the body of Christ. God will do it regardless, but I want to be part of the willing, deliberate move of God. And on that note, you know, having read the book and having discovered that there's so much more, I know that there's a few of us and we have spoken at length about this with with DB, I don't know if he's ever mentioned it to you, there's a few of us who are willing to support the work of making sure that all the other stories are told and they are told well. And uh, you know, there's Shola who's uh, on the review today. Shola is a great, and she's, she's she, at, at, when she first heard about it, she's like, I'm have to make sure that I'm in, I want to do this, I want to do this. You know, there are some people who God has put it in their heart to make sure that not only this particular edition goes out, but that it continues to get renewed and revived and all the other stories come out. There's, there are some people today that we know that God has put that burning desire and ah. we are willing to do what is required. Let, let, We're willing let, to go the journey. We know it's, you know, to support that, it because- that, I'm glad to hear that. I'm it's glad to hear that. that. It's, even good. it's glad. even good that uh, Robbie is bringing it out, uh, Mama. Yes. I've, I've, I mean, this was a conversation I, I wanted to have with you at our next meeting. Um, Coach Lillian is here. And the first time she met with me, I think in 2019 or 2020, she said to me, I don't mind volunteering to, pro to proofread <laughs> or, to, or to write. If Baba is looking for a, a script writer, Tell Baba, writer. I'm, I'm, avail I'm available now. Coach Lillian is, I mean, very, very well accomplished person, uh, very resourceful. Um, uh, Olushan Adiola was another person. And then she's an editor. Robbie, she's a Robbie, very yeah. great editor, yeah. yes. And, and, and Robbie told me that, oh, that Chola, Chola just wanted to be part of this book. She wants to be. Robbie herself had told me, Robbie the anchor, sir, had told me that. She wants to meet you by all means in that her lifetime. Yes, that she does I not want to. Be. So, because <laughs> when I when I say these stories, uh, these stories have now made me look older than my age. People <laughs> are always surprised. Like, who are you? Are you really? But it's because of people like Baba. It's because of great blessings that they've been to me, and I believe that he is the major last link to the end time revival we are going to see. And I'm grateful to God in my lifetime and I do not take it for granted at all in any way, shape or form. So there are people here, sir. They want to be part of what you are doing. I don't want to stand in their way at all. Some of them are in America. Some of them are here. Anyhow the link can happen, 
it's now time for it to happen. <laughs> I mean, yes. others have joined, others have come to say oh, they want to make it into something and I've told Baba about that, but I mean, I've not committed to anybody, but I also know that these people, they really love Jesus and they are genuine, they are sincere. I've, I've, I've been with some of them a couple of times uh, and I can tell that they are true Christians, they are sincere, they are not uh, scammers, they are not fraud, they are not people that have once come to you to steal your stories, to steal your, your initiatives and to sell out, not even you know, coming back to tell you how it has been since it wasn't their own idea. But these people, they are just willing to support your work, uh, to support the things that have been said. One of them went to a school in the U.S. She's not here. And she went to a school and she was, I mean, she was looking at the library and she was so appalled that there was no, there was nothing. There was no story, no story about Babalola, no story about Babajide, no story about uh, Rekoya, no story about Omotunde, no story, nothing about Nigeria in Nigeria. So these people are really, really ready, sir. And uh, it's now over to you. <laughs> Is it still on or are we having internet problems? Again. Okay. DP, we can't hear him. So should we continue or do you want to check with him if he has dropped off oh, internet again? Okay, so we can just continue. Oh, no, 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 there he is. There he is. Okay, sir, do you have a response for us, uh, final words? So, uh, that's all right. The, of recent, I discovered that uh, so many people, I mean, because of the impact of some of these works, it has reached people. And, uh, well, people have been coming up to show interest, and I'm glad about that. I see that too as that the approachment as, uh, well, a sign that at least, at last, this message is gaining ground among Africans. And I can, uh, I can only pray that it continues. So it's your welcome, okay? We get to know each other. I need as much support as I can get, okay, in every way. This is not somebody's uh, one person's project. Like I always used to tell people, it should be every, it should be all of us. It's our project, it's our history, it's our heritage, okay? And uh, it is sad that I've had to pay so much sacrifice, but it is well. Rachel, Jacob, uh, after 14 years for Rachel, it wasn't so sad because at least he loved her, okay? <laughs> that she has paid so much. So I'm really glad that it is better. Internet. Oh, wow. Really need solid internet connections in this country. Okay, while we wait for him to while we wait for him to come back or to reconnect, we'll just stop once we hear him. But I think it's you not know, that you were talking. I think the question you were addressing was on was on um, the um, the early years of Samson upon this. Um, we Shala has given us a setting, the background before he came on the scene, and you were giving us his early years, the trade that he was into, how he grew up, and what formed his early impressions or the man that he um, 
he was, he became. I think that's what you were speaking to. Would you like to just continue on that? You need to unmute yourself. Oh, hold on. I think he's back. Yes, I'm back. Yes, he can continue, sir. <laughs> Okay, yes, I've said I've said all. I said you are welcome. I'm glad to hear that. So I think we'll still have a forum to meet. Okay. The trouble is that this uh, Zoom is always the way it's called. Uh, I'm, I don't usually like, uh, I think I prefer WhatsApp is my, maybe I'm the king of WhatsApp. WhatsApp is my, is my, is my prefer platform. I can do wonders of WhatsApp. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, sir. <laughs> well, we'll this, <laughs> so maybe one of these days we have a WhatsApp forum where you can type your question. I will type the answer. I like that. You get it? Uh -huh. So yes, not much of uh, because this one, the way it cuts people off, I don't like Zoom. I don't like the. Uh, <laughs> yes. So sir. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, it's it's my honor, and happy. I'm I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. It's our pleasure having you and we're deeply, deeply grateful for just, you know, bringing, as you said, as you started, that Christians need to be knowledgeable. Christians need to be the most well-read because we we fight with, so we battle against, um, not against flesh and blood, but principalities, but even then, you know, it embodies itself with misinformation or people coming at us with wrong information and challenging us. It's, uh, I think um, Paul said to Timothy, study to show yourself a approved, a man who does not need to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. And it applies here that we have to be knowledgeable. We cannot be ignorant Christians. The enemy is not ignorant. So uh, we thank you for the work. We thank you for the sacrifice on your life and on your family, because whatever you do, there is, you know, they came along with you. They paid a price to read. They supported you one way or the other. So God bless you and um, God bless this work. DB, would you like to just close out and we we'll continue? Yeah, thank you so much everyone for, for this rare, rare opportunity for me. It's a rare privilege. Uh, it's very difficult to get Baba, um, and it's what my talking, my teaching, my everything, that is what I've been trying to communicate to the world, that some people need to be met, some people need to be known. In one's life, you might, it's just one person you will meet, and it will make a, it will cause a serious turnaround in your life, you know. And for me, it's just for Christian community to meet Baba, either physically through me or through books or through, so everywhere I go, uh, because I'm part of that heritage, um, I see myself as completely soaked into uh, all of the work of the fathers, the genuine fathers, you know, that have gone unrecognized, but God, really, really recognize them and he, he rewards them as his own. And for me, um, I, um, I pray every day for God to give Baba strength. The last time I went to his house, I cried when I left the place. I didn't tell him. But I cried when I left the place because I, I, I was just looking at a lot of things he needed, he needs to do before he leaves this place. And the resources were just so little. The resources, the support weren't coming. And this is someone that, I mean, is it 30, 40? I don't know how many years he has committed to this. It's a whole lot of, you know, uh, meaningful uh, part of his lifetime that he has committed to these things. And I, I just pray that God will, you know, I don't want it to just be, oh, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. I really want children of God to really do something about it. And when we say things like this, we think it's only about money. No, it's not. I believe strongly that this is a collective story. Okay. This is a collective story. So in whatever way uh, we want to support, please, let's jump right in. 
Baba is available. Uh, I will make him available um, by force, by fire. <laughs> you can count on me for that, even if it's to arrange uh, a program that it might be for like two, three days. And we will plan it very well so that everybody can be connected globally to listen to him. He has quite a lot to say. Whenever I go to his house, I don't plan when to leave. <laughs> and I don't have anything to say. I just sit down there, you know, to get as much as I can get from him. And it's such a blessing to have him here. I pray that all the fathers that he represents, all that he represents on earth, God will make all of the other people to know this work that Baba has done. Uh, Well-researched work, a lot of manuscripts with him. A lot of them he has done for years. This one, made some of them was going for about 18 years. This one was, so quite a lot of them that have not even you know, gotten to, to be printed out. So it's a privilege, sir. Uh, thank you so much for yeah. honoring thank within you. this little thank you. time. Thank you, Daniel. DB, thank you. Please, there is that my old, uh, one of my old students in Nilori. Yes, Who come from South Africa. Can you help me get his uh, contact? Okay. Okay, we'll get his details. I think he said he sent something. He said, he saying, I can't see the, I can't see the, I used to be the leader of the Christian Union uh, at Ilori during my time. So I'm sure that's one of our students in those days. One of, uh, it's usually a pleasure to meet one of them. So I will be glad. He said he sent uh, his contact something. Can you help me get that and, and forward to me? Danny. I'll do that, sir. I'll All right. Do that. Yes, sir. Thank I'll you. Do that, sir. Thank you. So I think I'm excused now. Yes, sir, you are. Thank you very right. much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. God bless you. All right. Okay, people, that was wonderful. I actually really, really enjoyed that. It was good of him to come and just spend that time with us. I, I just, I'm excited inside me. So thank you all. Now we return to our review. Tunade, are you there? Um. Tunade, are you there? We can't see you and neither can we hear you. Okay, there you are. Can't hear you. Oh, okay. While wow, she's... I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but we can't see you. There's okay. all black. I don't know why, because my video is showing here. Oh, there you are now. So you can see me now and yes, hear me? me. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, so I was saying, um, we were talking about Samsung um, Opong, but um, I was explaining that before he became Samsung, he was Kwame. So he was born Kwame Opong. And um, we know about his family that his father had three wives. Um, two, the, two of the wives were slaves. His father was a slave and his father was married to a free woman. Now, the marriage of his father to that free woman was beneficial to the father because he, it um, elevated his status. But it was a problem. It later became a problem for Kwame um, who later became Sam, Sam, Samsung. It later became a problem for him because this father's wife had a brother who was a traditional healer. Um, it was a fetish man and he was a magician. And it was this man that actually, he, he, he took a liking to Opong and it was that relationship that actually brought Opong into the fetish world. It was this man that introduced him to this lifestyle and this um, business, so to speak. So in Ashanti culture, it says here that the medicine man and the fetish practitioners were feared and respected. And Opong liked that. He liked that um, idea. He grew um, um, old. He became 
um, he got involved in the dark mysteries and he could heal people, he could do all sorts of things. I mean, he was actually well known for his magical arsenals, <laughs> as um, it was put here. So, I don't want to um, spend too much on that so that we can really delve into the important things. Um, now, it was very interesting to note that in 19, 1896, there was a crisis between the Ashanti Native Kingdom and the British Imperial Power. And um, like this, this, this happened, and um, there was a free. They were freed. So there was now um, just immediately that happened. There was a motive, and something came. The British made domestic slavery illegal throughout the country, and just like that, slaves became free. Now this was a boy that was born into slavery. That was all he knew, and all of a sudden, he became a free man so um he went on he this freedom he just began to mismanage it he got a job <laughs> he got this is a really sad part he got a job um and um in that job it was um he it was a recruitment of laborers into the french colony of ivory coast where railway was being built so he got this job and he was like the um like the foreman he was the foreman of those who chopped firewood for the locomotives now one day he had he collected all the money and he was to disburse the money as the foreman and at the end of the week one day he just collected all the wages and <laughs> and just made away with all the money in other words he stole the money and ran away so he i mean he went off he this was total greed he ran away he and he began to drink he began to womanize those were his two main flaws drinking and womanizing and unfortunately for him it was that womanizing that got him into trouble because he went ahead and was playing hanky panky with a policeman's wife this is so a man who had stolen money and then he was messing about with the policeman's wife and so when the woman found out how the money that he was spending came about and all that of course she reported and at the end of the day he was caught and he was thrown into prison so this is a man that came out of slavery his bad behavior got him back into bondage because i don't you know some to put it that way so thank well this god that we serve is a very merciful god so it was whilst he was in prison that the Lord met with him and he met a man in prison. Now they don't know, um, there's really no, no reason why that man was um, in prison, but inside his cell there was a Christian, he was a, a deeply religious man from the fancy tribe named Moses. So this man was a man of prayer and he prayed every hour on the hour. So, and the cause of his imprisonment was not known. But it was this man that just three days after Opong was brought into the prison, you know, this man, this Moses was, was, um, there, was a, there was an order for him to be released. And as Moses was about to leave, Opong begged him for money. I don't, I don't even understand that because how can, you are all prisoners together. I don't know how you are expe <laughs> expecting a fellow prisoner to have money. Anyway, it shows how, how greedy he was really uh, for money, you know. Anyway, so he often begged Moses for money to buy food. But Moses too, of course, he was a prisoner. He didn't have any money. So he said that he would give him something that money could not buy. And he prayed for, Moses prayed for Opong, you know, the prayer of uh, Peter. He says, I have no money, but what, that which I have, I shall give to you. I commend you into God's keeping. And that was all Moses said to Opong. Now, Opong was very upset <laughs> about this prayer. He was very upset. And um, he was, he was I, mean, I mean, it was actually recorded here that his, his response to that prayer was that of rage and fury typical of an average man 
So that what this, this man was saying, I'm hungry. Which one is you commending me to God and all that? But that prayer would be one of the best things that would happen to Opong. So what happened was in the night that he had a dream. And in this dream, two Europeans came into his cell. And the elder one, in, in the dream, the elder one saw through his chains and said, I am the God of Moses. Burn your magic things and beat the gong for me. That is, proclaim my word. So he was very happy. You know, he had this dream that he was going to be released. He was released. Not that he was, he was, uh, that he was released. And he was very happy. But upon waking up, he found out that it was just a dream and he was really upset about that. That very day, you know, the Lord actually used Europeans to get him out of prison. It was this European administrator, the French district commissioner, just looked at him and told him that, look at this young man. So God actually intervened and this white man called for him and, you know, literally broke his chains like he had in the dream. And this man offered to accommodate Opong. Now, the man accommodated him, took him out from the cell and brought him into his house. But this old nature was written that this old nature that was troubling this open just kept following him. He actually didn't have a a relationship with the Lord like that. He didn't have you know, he had this encounter that brought him out of the of, 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 of the cell, but he didn't have a a a um, salvation, a proper salvation encounter. And I think that was the issue here because this he was brought out of the cell and Three days later, he ran from the house of this um, French district commissioner that housed him. So he ran away from this man and he crossed the border and he escaped into Ghana. But now, what happened was he knew, he just knew that there was a God that was called the God of Moses because he had had a dream. Yes, he had had a dream that. Of, of a relation of him of someone that revealed himself as the god of moses so that was the background and that's thank it thank you thank you for just capturing all of that intricate detail and i just want to uh, make sure just to highlight important things in what she um Tunade has said a lot we don't want you to miss the, the details he was born a slave then all of a sudden um slavery slavery was um uh, dissolved and he became a free man. He went to look for work and he ran all the way to Ivory Coast to look for work. He got a good job. He was even given responsibility. He was also responsible for paying the wages to his colleagues, the other workers there. One bright day, he thought to himself, all this money, I could just, just imagine what I could do with it. I don't have to give it to them, do I? So he made away with all that money and ran away. And as I, I thought to myself, okay, so you have all this money, people's money, you've duped them off, you're not thinking, you have no empathy, no thought for your fellow man. Okay, fine. What are you going to do with the money? He entered nightclub, drinks and women, or bar, nightclub, bar, anyone. He would drink and women. And I love the way that the author describes it. He said it was he was in, engaged in riotous living. And I thought, yes, that, that's it, riotous living, just squandering the money that he had stolen. I mean, that's what typically happens when you get money the wrong way. And, um, and then one of the persons he chose to flirt with, I don't know, maybe he didn't know she was married. And not only that she was married, that she was a policeman's wife, like he couldn't have been wrong. You know, how much wronger can you go? A married woman and now a policeman's wife for someone who's on the run, the authorities are looking for you. And the I mean, we would like to call her Delilah, but really, was she a Delilah? He was in the wrong. Or, and she, what is the source of your money? And you know, women, we can get out information if, when we want to get it out. She got it out. I don't know what she did to him. Maybe in his drunken experience, she touched him the right way, said the right things, and he sang like a canary. I just stole money. I stole all this money. And guess what happened? Um, he... Um, he, uh, he gets caught and gets thrown in jail. Like it was just all kinds of foolish. That, that whole story was just all kinds of foolish. And it was there that he now 
for the first time he hears the mention of or the first time we're told he actually hears the mention of God somebody prays for him but you know and um he gets free God was true to his word set him free the next day you will think that he would be reflective no he was an opportunist he was ready to go because that old man that was in him remember his his stepmother's brother had groomed him in sorcery from when he was young so he had been real and the thing the point that I, something i was thinking about when i read the book is that sorcery is so wicked wickedness is wicked i mean the devil is wicked it has no human empathy because sorcery really is and witchcraft is really about you um your 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 business is for the highest bidder and it is not it isn't even the smaller things you're bidding it you know we're eventually going to see i really want to jump uh push us there that you know in his journey we get to a point where he meets a lot of he meets a few people and he tries to kill them he's a man for he's a killer for hire i think that's the that's the term he's a killer for hire you pay him money we know how this works we pay him money you don't like your neighbor you want your neighbor's neck to twist to the left and he will do what it takes your neighbor's neck twist to the left you you know you pay him the money you want your your competitor's business to scatter he will do it your competitors that just has no human empathy you're not even thinking about the next person you're just thinking about who has paid me the money i will do the service i don't care what happens i'm just the guy that's get paid and he was just he was a terror he was really good at his job so he was quite um quite um they were really afraid of him and i think shortly after that he um a series of things happened he banded him he met this woman i think he got a job somewhere and uh, met this particular woman or was that what he started to go to church he met a christian woman who hired him he started to and the woman went to church he started to go to church i think it was around christmas period and you know christmas christians we have all the jesus events coming up baby jesus event oh silent night um you know um what do we call nativity and he was intrigued by that he wanted to he wanted to experience it so he went to church with her and he, the, the the book says that he paid a woman to get up from her seat so he can sit down and i'm just thinking <laughs> this man was just riot riot all through in him but and he witnessed that experience of that was his first time of ex experiencing christmas he wanted to understand what is this thing you're talking about but then the message in the church wasn't uh I think was that the one where the message in the church was just anti him because they started no no that wasn't it that wasn't it so he he then decided he liked what he had heard and he wanted to become a christian he wanted to follow the way remember he had no formal education so he was not literate so and as we know it we've established that to become a christian then you had to read that's the first thing you learn to read and you begin to re read all the requirements so he started to learn to read he was an adult and he was learning with children and they laughed at him like children do they laugh at you they laugh at themselves they mocked him for being an adult who was struggling to read and he couldn't take the heat he just couldn't take the mockery and he decided i'm not doing it again you know literally that's the way i interpret i'm not doing it again these children are laughing at me i'm a grown man i can do other things with myself so um so he went off back into his sorcery and he, he was good at it, he was doing then. Um, I think he, he started to live somewhere. He got a new job. He started to live somewhere again. And um, in, where he was living, there was this woman who was a Christian and she liked to pray. That was his problem. He hated her. He literally hated her, not for anything that she had done wrong, but because she prayed and that just... I, I mean, prayer is so powerful. It just disturbs the devil. It just disturbs darkness. It turns them one way. And if you're a praying person and you get attacks a lot, you know why? You're irritating the heck out of, out of darkness. So not that God doesn't love you or that God is not protecting you, but dark, you're disturbing a lot of darkness and they are rumbling. So um, he, I think eventually he was invited to her church and the, the pastor... <laughs> Of all the topics he could preach on, if we was preaching on, you should not kill people. <laughs> it 
you shouldn't kill. It is wrong to kill. And that sent him out through the door. He just bolted like a nut and he hated them the most. But his encounter really started, his final surrender, because in all of this, you can see that God had been chasing him and God had, true to the nature of God, patience. He sowed the seed in prison and he revolted. He, uh, he actually, um, then um, he, he, he was released according to God's word. He revolted. He ran away from that. Then he uh, met with this Christian woman and had the Christmas experience. He revolted. He didn't like it. One excuse or the other. Then he moves into this home where there's this woman who prays that and he was, he didn't like her. God had just been steadily working in his irritation. And that's how God sometimes pursues us. Like God's chase after our hearts is so beautiful. He's so patient. He is so patient. Like, oh my God, thank you, Jesus, for your patience. You know, so here we are at what really changes and what really, what really changes, uh, um, changes. I think I want to leave that to Shola. What, what was the real, how did the final turning point happen? What were the events that led up to it? And what happened in his um, as he as he finally surrendered and stopped running? Well, I just want to, you know, in in answering that question, pick up from highlighting the things that you said. You know, one of the things that you just said is the power of a very simple prayer. Um, and it was fascinating, you know. Uh, well, well, before before I even say that, for someone who makes a living out of, you know creating talismans that kill people. You would think prison would be a good business ground for him. <laughs> as, you were, <laughs> as you were talking, I was like, oh, but why was he broke in prison? I mean, yeah. surely, surely, you know, that would be good business ground for him. But, you know, that's the funny thing about, um, I don't know people who dabble in these things. I hear they still exist today. I don't know anyone personally. But sometimes I wonder at the, the lack of logic you would think they would be the wealthiest people in the world, they're not. You would think, you would think that they could get themselves out of prison, they can't. You know, who, is, who do we hear breaking people out of prison? Angels. <laughs> Thank you. Good points. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> people who surrender to powers of darkness, I'm like, they don't do, they can't help you when you get into trouble. <laughs> it's angels that break people out of prison. Um, and that leads me to the point that I was going to make that this man that prayed every hour, I'm pretty sure he never spoke to this, you know, never had any meaningful interactions. But the man said, look, you're leaving, give me money. It's like, okay. Well, in the Bible, it says that Peter that didn't have money gave, gave someone something. Maybe I should try that prayer for you. And sometimes it's just simple prayers, you know, and I think I'm just saying this for everybody on the call. You really never know what it is that you're doing that God will use. Um, we think it's something profound when we see it. But then when you get to heaven and you see the real of your life, you'll be surprised at the things that God used to touch other people's lives. So don't despise simple, very, very simple moments and simple prayers. And the other thing that, that, I always, that, that struck me about Samson is just, you know, when, when, when um, he, he went from Kwame to Samson, and I'm pretty sure that that was a personal choice. I'm just like, of all the... Of the all the names, names you could choose. <laughs> Why that name? Why that name? And unfortunately, he lives up to that name. So as you're reading the story or you're, you're learning about the story of Samson, Umpon, just remember, there's a reason why Samson is in the Bible. We may not fully understand what that reason is, <laughs> but this man, this man is a living embodiment of that story. So just as Robbie was saying, he, he, he God, God made a way for him to exit the prison. And it was purely the mercy of God. Did he listen? Did he surrender? No, he wanted to go back into his evil ways. He, he found work in a, in a home and he met a Christian woman. And as Robbie said, uh, he went to church. They preached thou shalt not kill. She invited him to church. They preached thou shalt not kill. And he said, it's almost as if that word fired him up. He actually tried to kill the woman. Yeah. And it was, it was funny. That was one of the things it was like, thou shalt not kill. He tried to kill her through idolatrous, uh, through by creating magical elements. It didn't work. He put poison in her food. So fine, my idolatry worked. My magic did not work. Let me 
poison is not magic. You can find things that are poisonous to human beings in the natural realm and put it in their food. And the funny thing is she had no reaction. Um, and so again, the scripture of, you know, those that are called that follow the Lord of Jesus, what did it say, right? Um, about us, I can't remember it exactly, but that we're immune to these things. Um, especially she prayed, when she prayed over the food. She prayed over the food and ate it and said and told him directly and that nothing him. can happen to me. So she knew. She, she knew, knew that he had poisoned the food. And yes. like, you know what? She actually you want prayed. to try my God. Nothing is going to happen. Watch nothing me Nothing is eat. going Watch to happen. Eat. Like that woman had courage because I'll be like, I pray over it, but I'm not eating it. You know, I will, we, <laughs> we will think twice. I think that kind of test is better for me to not know. I don't need to know that there's poison in my food. I just need to, <laughs> to operate in faith, you know? Um, but it's it's amazing. And and what also strikes me is God's when when God is chasing after you, there's nothing, there's almost nothing you can do. Like God did not give up on Samson. He didn't give up on him. Um, where he finally met his match in terms of facing God was um, they had their own day on Thursday where they're not meant to work. Um, and a young boy had said he, he had hired him to kill his uncle. Um, for, and wealth, had, to, for wealth transfer. That's his own interpretation transfer. of wealth transfer. I will kill my uncle, then take his wife and take his money. <laughs> you know, honestly, sometimes you have to admire the simplicity of these things. You know, all he wanted was to marry his uncle's wife and inherit the money. Life is very, life is not complicated. You don't need too much, you know, out of it. I went to go and meet a magician called the Kwame, uh, Kwame Opong to create an amulet that would tie his father to the ground or something along those lines. Um, and in the middle of that, um, God appeared to him. Um, and showed him a vision, you know, basically just said that um, it wasn't clear whether it was a physical vision or something in his mind's eye. But what is clear is that he was arrested. He, in the middle of doing this, he, 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 was, he was able to, God captured him, captured his attention. Um, so and he always the, the, the in the in the vision what, what what we are told about the vision is like he could see people he could see like a gathering and some kind of a bonfire and people were there yeah. and people were throwing all their charms and you know i think that was god's final way of saying enough is enough throw away and yeah. that essentially became his message his message became burn up and get rid of your of your idols yes and and the beauty you know what i love about about this encounter this one um is god spoke to him and said look i'm the same person that freed you from prison in case you don't know he said, like, take up take up my cross and preach about it to the world and um uh kwame responded i can't speak english i can't read how can i preach and the lord said i shall go with you come and see the sign i will give you and he was taken to a lake of blood. And I'm, I'm just reading, but it's, it's worth reading. Um, and and it, it was almost as if God was showing him, this is the result of all that you've been doing. The lake of blood was where, you know, the blood shed by wicked people, sorcerers and kings. The Ashanti kingdom had been a place of bloodshed. He saw past kings who were made to be drinking the blood of this lake as punishment for the evil they perpetrated on earth. And this was a warning that if he continued on this path, he would end up here or worse. Grace had intervened on his behalf. Um, and this is the mercy of God that he, he will continue to chase after you, to chase after you, chase after you, chase after you. In the midst of trying to kill people, God is like, I want you to be mine. I want you to be mine. I wonder what happened to the boy that was with him. As he was working the chat. <laughs> be careful but, who you follow because it might just be the, the day of encounter with the Lord that you know, but, you, know you, might, wrong, you might down the wrong yeah. path, but God has yeah. taken them. Yes, but but that was that was what turned the tide. And so he received his new name. It says that, that, that God actually gave him this name. So I think God knew his children very well and named him appropriately. 
Um, and then he also carried a wooden cross. And I think this is interesting because in some of the other in some of the other uh, characters, uh, revivalists, they often carried a symbol. Yeah. You know, they, they they carried something. It wasn't just they didn't just go preaching and by the charisma of their words. They actually had these things. And I think it's, it says that, and this is one of the ways that they knew their people more than the foreigners. I think that the natives needed to see a symbol of power. There's something powerful about the symbol and there is really nothing more powerful than the cross. My goodness, when you think about the cross, you think about the suffering of Jesus Christ. When you think that every sin, every curse, the, the, you know, you know, in, in the Old Testament, Moses did the serpent on a pole and people had to gaze upon it to gain their healing. And Jesus Christ on the cross is the future picture of that same, you gaze on the cross, you, you get your healing. And, and not just Samson, but some of the other revivalists carried the cross with them. Not a, when I say cross, not the kind that we wear around our neck, but a physical yeah, like yeah. a big cross that you could see you know um and so you know so so that was something that he carried around with him everywhere that he went and he was preaching and in his early days of preaching he was just i think i i'm i'm, I'm now reading in between the text he was preaching from his own experience from 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 the little that he knew from the little that he had learned but he further went into another prison experience purely by, in a ways by accident, he didn't do anything wrong, but he called someone out to be a witch and it caused problems in the area that he was in. The woman, even though the woman eventually confessed, she denied it, denied it, the people around her um, were supporting her. Even the British were like, you can't be calling out witches any which way. So they arrested him, <laughs> they arrested him. That's um, funny that the, the, the British will be like, you know, you can't be calling out witches because one minute we had Baba Lola. Was it Baba Lola they threw into prison for, you know, um, uh, yeah, it was Baba Lola. Uh, they threw into prison for, what did they call it? Meddling with witchcraft, something, something, you know? And the other hand, they are now saying you can't be calling out people, you calling people witches. So it's, it's double standards. Like, yes, when it double suits standard. you. Yeah. You decide. So I wonder what they had against him that um, that they decided, you know, um, we're going to take that side here. Sorry, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not clear. It's not clear, but clearly, I think I think that from my understanding, they just they just didn't want anything that would disrupt their trade, their business, their governing of the place. And it's the same thing that happened to Jesus. Once you become a destabilizing influence and the people are agitated, the colonial masters of, of, of Jesus' time were the Romans. They colonized the Jews and they were like, come, we don't want to kill you, but you're a disabling influence. And we just we need we need peace to reign. Same thing here, the British will arrest him. You are just you're you are a disabling influence. Whether this man is a witch or not is really not besides the point. The point is we imprisoned you. But what was more profound about this prison experience was that he received um what would you call it? He, he, he had, this is where he received um, a flat stone. God showed him a stone. And what isn't clear to me, I don't know, Robbie, or it's no idea if you, if you have this, whether the stone was physical or, if, or something that he could just access. In the it, was it was a physical stone that he carried in a, in a handkerchief. Yes. So he actually carried that stone about and he would look into the stone. It, it's actually quite fascinating because... That's supernatural. <laughs> this stone... He could quote the Bible. He could quote scripture, verse, chapter, reference. It's actually put the book in the Bible. So this gave him a supernatural ability to declare, to preach the word from the Bible. So up until this point, um, it wasn't it, it wasn't clear that he was preaching the word. It, was, it seemed as if he was preaching the gospel, but from a place of experience and calling people for salvation. But after this prison encounter, God gave him the ability to preach the word from the Bible. This is someone who dropped out of cate catechism, uh, is catechumen, but in my mind is catechism classes. He, he didn't have patience to read, to study, to, to become learned. And yet God said, you know, 
in spite of that, I'm going to still help you. In spite of that, I'm going to still help you. Um, and and this 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 for me was fact. I mean, I want I want this. I, I prayed to the Lord. I said, look, I don't necessarily want a stone, but I want the word in me. Yes. I, 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 you know, I want the word in me because I believe the word of God is powerful. Um, and, 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 and we read the Bible, but you know, it's, you know, unless you are growing up and you're memorizing scripture, it's not always in you, you know, we thank God that now we can just, as a, as a, as a line is coming to your mind, you just Google it and it give you the full <laughs> reference and you can read the whole thing. Um, but how powerful is it to have the word in you where you can bring it up? That, that there is a, there is a word for every situation, every circumstance, um, and before truly, you move on from before you move on yes, from from that point and go to the next, I think Tunade, do you want to add something about the, you know? Um, yes, I wanted to. I wanted to say something about that. You know, when I saw when I read that part, as as supernatural as it was, I was um, I was hit by something, and I wrote it down, and I want to share that. I said it is possible to have spiritual power. Um, without the in-depth knowledge of God's word. And it is our responsibility to acquaint ourselves with God's word. You see, because later on in the story, it was said of him that because he didn't really, he couldn't really read the scriptures. He had not learned, you know, to read and write. So he couldn't really read. And that stone worked only when he was minist preaching. You know, um, the stone gave scripture in line with what he was preaching so he didn't get to really read the bible and we know we are supposed to read the bible not just for us to preach but we are supposed to read the bible to practice for ourselves and i think that was the major um downside of his story because he didn't know the bible he could not read to practice for himself he could read to preach but he couldn't read to practice for himself and it was written there later on that if he had read the Bible, he probably would have read the story of Samson. Yes. <laughs> you know, and he probably would have seen the end of Samson. To know that, you see, this lifestyle, there is an end, and the end is actually not good. But because he didn't have that knowledge, because he couldn't read, you know, and that is a lesson for us. It's not enough for us um, to just be supernatural. It's not enough for us to be able to preach to people it is yeah. first and foremost the salvation of our soul. Yes. It is first and foremost what is happening within us. Because at the end of the day, just because of that, he was powerful and all that. I mean, don't let's, you know, but he was powerful and all that. But just that issue was what caused a major downfall in his ministry. And that was what I just wanted to point out. Education is so important. Um, when um, the author um uh, was talking earlier he said christians have to be learned have to be well read you know you know it's it's just it's coming out again and it's i think it's been evident throughout some of people who really struggled with some doctrines in the bible it was because of their lack of knowledge of it or they hadn't really seen it and some of it was because they could not read they couldn't read um they couldn't read or didn't read today we can read but we don't read then they couldn't read. He, he didn't have the patience to read, learn how to read when he had the, he had the opportunity. opportunity. By God's divine mercy, he gave him supernatural ability to read when he needed to for the purpose of propagating the gospel. But, you know, like Shola said, but our prayer is that the word of God will be living. We want the word in us. That's what we're, you know, what we're pushing for today, that the word will be in us for us first and foremost before we can say that we are bringing a message to people right okay over to you shola to finish up your earlier thoughts oh no 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 no! i finished up my earlier thoughts but um i just wanted to say that the, his ability to to um to access the word really uh amped up his ministry mm. it says here that he 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 preached once he was once he was released from prison he preached a dozen times a day, you know, 12, out, 12, 12 times in a day um, and everywhere that he went. So he, he had his cross, he had the stone and he preached in power. Mm. You know, he preached in power because he had access to the word. 
And so you now had massive conversions and he was able to access King. Mm. He was, um, and I think because he was a known magician. So it's, and I'm sure as people encountered him, he said, was this not the one that was practicing magic and killing people now coming in and, and they must have no, you know, you know, he must have been known in the region. He's not learned. He's not educated. He's the son of a slave in the, in the Ashanti region. And then here he is preaching in power, preaching eloquently the word of God, um, not using any magic. You know, I don't see, I don't, you know, we didn't read about him doing, doing those, you know, feats, the same feats that he was doing. Isn't that actually quite interesting? His ministry was not marked by those kinds of signs and wonders. Hmm. Okay. It wasn't, you yes. know, it's, it's interesting, but his ministry is yeah. I, think, by I it. think it's because the ministry, the, the, it was too short. You know, he, it, it was recorded Plenty that difference. before he could, uh -huh. mm -hmm. he could, before cool. he could, um, before the ministry really took off, <laughs> it, it, it went down. So he couldn't, there couldn't have been, he was just starting. He was just beginning. That might, that might even, well be. Yeah, okay, go on, Shola. Yeah, but even, even if he's just beginning, um, just, you know, we'll, we'll talk about his demise, but even if he's just beginning, in two years, he could have done a lot. Too. He could have done a lot. He, he, his ministry was not marked by healing. His ministry was not marked by the same, you know, for someone who was coming from a place of magic, People recognize power without necessarily seeing the magic. So, so there was there must have been something about him, about the word, the power of the word to touch people's hearts, to pierce people's hearts, that they didn't need to see power signs. Yeah. It said that you know it, it, it because it's, it's a, it was a power move. If power had been released, a fire kindled on the Ashanti yeah. religious landscape, but it was kindled by the word not kindled by 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 him calling down i mean some of these revivalists will call down uh you know this person will die if you don't convert this will happen that will happen you know um there's a little bit of that but it's it, it, it's not something that marked his ministry um what marked his ministry was the ability the word um from, just from what the author has shared with us here you know um and so and, and so what happened is that the Methodist church grew exponentially. And, is uh, Shala breaking up? Um can you, you hear me? Now. Robbie, you are back. You okay. were breaking up. Okay. So I just wanted to, oh, okay. to round up that point. Uh, let me see if I can by saying that he led a hundred and ten thousand to Christianity. Um, and unfortunately, his his movement was brief, and I think I'll allow um, it's not a day to to talk about the end and the demise, and we can debate the the nature of his ministry in greater detail. But um, in a in a short period of time, he led 110,000 to Christianity, and not only that, he opened the doorway for the Methodist Church for the church to spread, for the church to spread in their shanty tribe where before it was seen as the religion of the colonial masters. Now they have seen one of their own um, radically transformed, um, moving in signs, but not in, but not in the same way as, as he was before. Um, and, and there's such, there's, there's something so bittersweet about how short his ministry was. I wanna but let me not give too much away and let and let it's not it continue. Or oh, Robbie, since you're back. I just wanted to say something about um the um not say something about um he was able to bring back. Robbie, you're good? Yes, I've changed okay. devices temporarily. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. So, you know, it was recorded at the beginning in the in the intro um, that there were missionaries, Methodist missionaries, two seasoned, it says, I mean, I think I'd like to read that because I think this is very instructive here. Two seasoned missionaries, Timothy Clark and W.G. Waterworth, labored from 1904 to 1921 with little fruit to justify their labor. Methodists numbered about 1,000 
which were made up of mostly traders and fancy tribesmen, but scarcely Ashantis. So in about 17 years, they were able to get just a thousand people. But when the Lord came in through Samson Okong, in two years, he was able, it was estimated that in all, 110,000 people were converted into the church as a result of the Opong movement. Now, I think that is remarkable. That is absolutely remarkable. These were two seasoned missionaries, and they could only get a thousand people in 17 years. A thousand in 17 years. And somebody comes from within the tribe and gets 110,000 in two years. I mean, there's so. That, that for me blew my mind and it, 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 it shows that with God, when God is really with you, it's not about how it, you know, the eloquence you have or what you, what, what you have or the, you know, the, all that paraphernalia around you, but really who is with you? Who is the one sending you? And if it is God that is sending you, there would be a remarkable difference between you that God is sending and somebody that is just going, you know. And I, I think I think that was really remarkable. All right, thank you for that, ladies. So I want to move us all the way to the end. Um, so what we've heard, we've heard his story, and we've heard the high point. Shola did a beautiful job of just telling us that you know, for somebody who came from sorcery from someone who came from such strong sorcery, you would think that, you know, a conversion to Christianity, his ministry will be marked with signs and wonders and but God really just knows what a people need. God does. Because perhaps they would have said, oh, it's his magic. He's remodeled or he's giving his magic a different brand, you know. Um, but it was a simple, he brought the gospel to the people and the same people who he had killed for and taken their money to do bad to their neighbors, or maybe you were the neighbor that he had done, he had taken money from somebody else to, you know, cripple your life or cripple your business. They listened to him. They, you know, they responded to the message. God calls people to a people. Not all of us, you know, no, I don't know of any one person that is called for everybody. There is somebody carrying a message for somebody. So you have a message and you have a voice for a particular people. And it is God that knows. It's like Paul the Apostle. He wasn't really that well received amongst the Jews. His message wasn't that well received. And he turned to the, um, to the Gentiles. And it flourished. Because of that, today, me and you, we're Christians. But somebody still needed to continue to do that work amongst the Jews and you know, the apostles did that. They continue to forward, propagate the gospel. God calls all of us individually and he gifts us so uniquely. Some of us, um, uh, our, you know, our ministry, our call will not be with the signs and excitement and wonders, but it doesn't make it less effective or less useful or less God um, than the other person. If you remember Apollo or Kivibulia, I cannot remember the pronunciation, I always struggle, of the Buganda kingdom, that man, from when he met the Lord to when he died, and he lived a really long time, that man, not one single healing of headache, we're not told that he healed headache, but the uh, pygmies, the pygmies of the Congo region, the dark places that nobody will go to, he went with the gospel of Jesus and they loved him. They received him. It said of him that um, a white missionary said, when I see him, I feel like I should kneel down for him to pray for me. That was a sense of, that was, he, he, he was he, just trying to describe that he was carrying such a powerful, gentle spirit of God that you just have to respect the man that he is. You have to honor him. But one headache, he did not heal. Yet, a whole region turned their life over to Jesus in, in um, Buganda kingdom. Buganda is part of what we call uh, Uganda today and all of that um, Central Africa, Buganda is East Africa up to Central Africa because he went to, to the Congo region. So he did such a marvelous work and there was no 
fun and fair about it. God is just so beautiful. Like he, you cannot, he, he alone truly knows what we need, what every life and every community really needs. So that was his, that was his, um, his story. And I, I want to talk about quickly what led to his downfall. He had been, he had this vow of consecration. He recognized that his two biggest challenges were alcohol and women, they were his vice, vices. And he had made a pact with God, I'm going to stay away from this. And he was true to it until the devil came knocking. The devil came in the form of <clears throat> this uncle that had groomed him in sorcery, the brother of his father's other wife. Somehow we are told that the guy gets, nobody else knew that he had this vow and he had abstained, but this man either knew or had been looking for a way because the devil will always, if you're a light shining, if you're a light shining, the devil will be looking for how to trip you up because you're a problem to him. And so he got him on a bad day and we all have bad days. We all have the day that we pray the devil never finds us, you know, and we, or we pray that in those bad days, we'll be surrounded by righteous men and women who hold us up and make sure that we don't slip up. But in his bad day, he was alone. And that was the day that this man um, gave him, just piled him with drink. Take some. No, 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 no. You can take some more. I, I, just this one time, just drink. Drink. You know how you like this. Drink some more, drink some more. He drank until he drank himself out of control. He slipped into the old way. And from the drink came what? Women. He jumped into, I don't know how the woman came on the scene. That was it. He couldn't recover from that mistake. He felt like he had failed totally. He had failed God. He had broken his covenant with God. And he didn't have what we have today, accountability, or a place where you can go and lie down and cry and say, I've done it again. I've done it. I did wrong. Help me. He didn't have all of that. What did he do? He took matters into his own hands and ran away, left the ministry. And we're also told that when this happened, he lost the ability, the supernatural ability to read the Bible with that stone. That stone just now became an ordinary stone. It couldn't help him to read the Bible. He didn't deal with the shame. So he ran away and lived by himself in a forest and nursing his wounds and wouldn't even talk about it. It's something he refused to admit. It's like the greatest shame of his life. And I just want to encourage us. Today we have the privilege and benefit of so many people who can, who can support us. If you're struggling in sin, if you're struggling with any kind of struggle, because we are all struggling and at each point in time, we all struggle. Don't run away. When you make a mistake, when you slip up real badly, when you disappoint your own self, don't run away. Because when you run away into isolation, the devil will find you there and feed you his well-crafted lies. And those lies are so potent. You will continue to believe that lie and you will com completely, um, you, um, you will completely uh, miss out. So um, I just brought something to my mind that he was actually banished by the king as a form of, uh, as a form of punishment. I think they felt maybe deceit, you're, you're tricking us, whatever would he, whatever had happened. But he himself, my point now is that he himself didn't have the support where he could go to, that they would pray for him, tell him that he's forgiven by Jesus, that Jesus doesn't hold it against him and there's still a way. So he didn't have that. We have that today. And please take advantage of it. Please take advantage of it. Isolation kills. If the enemy keeps you away, he would feed you life and kill you because he has come to kill still and to destroy. But Jesus has come that we may have life and have it in abundance till it's full and overflowing. And he means it. There's a post I saw on Instagram the other day and it says that mature love, um, mature, uh, mature love does not make you afraid, but immature love brings fear and intimidation to you. I've now paraphrased it. The, the love of Jesus does not bring you fear and condemnation and shame, even in the midst of your dirt and the worst of you. Um, the love of Jesus doesn't, doesn't do that. It, 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 brings you, it brings you love and it lifts you up and brings you up. So that's what happened to him. And that was the sudden end of his ministry. We're not told of what happened, if there were any spin-offs, if anything happened with the people um, that encountered God through his ministry. But 
the, the point of this story is to say how God will use somebody who came from this background. He was born a slave, was a slave himself, and was stooped in magic, was killing people and, and maiming people and doing all kinds of things. And God just gently pursues him until God got him because God wanted, to evan wanted that region evangelized. Mm. And that's what he did. Over 110,000 people in a, in a matter of weeks or months turned their life over to Jesus. And what was his message? His message was, let go of sorcery and idolatry and face the true God. What a powerful message that will come from someone who was a mighty and feared sorcerer in his time. He says, he's now saying, let go of it. It doesn't work. There's a greater power. I've encountered a greater power and I need you to turn to that greater power. And, uh, you, you know, this issue of sorcery and idolatry, Shola and I were talking about it, that that was the message at the time. In fact, that was the predominant message of all the people, all the um, revivalists that God used in the, the earlier revivalists. Their fight was against letting go of household and community idols, idol worship, traditional worship, and turning to God. They let go of physical fetish and practices, you know. But then we pondered on it that even the message hasn't really changed today. It's still the same thing. It is still the same message. And I think I want to ask Shola to just um, share her thoughts on that, how the message of then and today, um, what the similarities are in that in 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 the two message in the in this eras wow Shows. robbie you put me on the spot i wasn't i <laughs> no so the, the the first time that we we did a, a book review um i remember being struck uh because i was saying that okay so these these powerful revivalists right were marked because they were they went into their own, into towns, villages, several places. And the call of repentance was to turn away from all these false idols and turn to the true God, Jesus Christ. And I said, okay, so fast forward to 2020 or 2021. And those of us, you know, are we calling, you know, like, you know, yeah, we're in Africa, but you know, Am I going to start going to villages and start calling people to to let go of idols and let go of of these things and follow God and and we, you know we have these ideas of no God needs to invade society and go into businesses and go into government. Yes, we're still calling people to convert from other religions, but the the concept of idolatry is not was is not real or wasn't real to me. And God led me to a place where He said, well. Actually, you're still called to lead people away from idolatry. The idols have just changed. And the idols are not, you know, necessarily graven, uh, carved wood, you know, or, 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 or golden stools, you know. Um, they've changed. Um, and God has personally taken me in a process of identifying um, idols in my life. Um, and the first place, this is a very hard one. I, I, gosh, Robbie, I was not planning to say it. Like, this was not on my mind. But the first thing is, anywhere where the word of God does not have power in your life, you have to check, is there an idol there? Um, I would have private time with the Lord. And in my private time with the Lord, I would receive revelation. I would, even just reading the Bible. And the word of God is powerful. And it's true. And it's real. And he says he's faithful. And that God is a God that honors his own promises. But then we go out um, and then there are things that happen in our lives that, 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 that seem to be more powerful than the word of God. And you're like, what? <laughs> so I actually went to God and I said, what is it? Why is it that when this thing happens, it tears down the very words that you gave me as if, no, God, prove yourself powerful. And God said, no. You tear down the idols in your life. I was like, whoa, you know, what have you set up in your life? And I know Robbie didn't want me to say this. I'm going to say it. <laughs> it's very controversial. And, you know, I am hoping this is a safe place to say such things. But when, when a country that has 
a significant, you know, when you say more than 70% of its population in poverty can raise 200 million naira to celebrate somebody's birthday. Um, for me, I just said, God, I don't understand. I don't understand this. Um, and, I, and I cried. I, I cried uh, because of the injustice. Um, it broke my heart because there are people who are starving, because there's famine in the land. Um, and it, and it's, it's been, I mean, we look upon it and we don't know what to do. Um, I'm personally powerless. Yes, he did the right thing, but the point was not what he did with the money. The point was that it happened. Um, and, and again, it's interesting because of the timing I'm reading this book again in preparation for, for this talk. And I'm seeing, and it's almost as if God is opening my eyes to see that there is idolatry is still there, that people are worshiping graven idols. My mind went to when the Israelites um, created, they were impatient. They couldn't wait for Moses to come back down from the mountain. And so they were like, give us a God we can worship. After coming out of Egypt, after seeing all the signs and wonders, they still needed, they still needed something. Um, so that's that's my comment on on idolatry, and I think it's very real. And I think that it starts with a personal exploration in our lives. Where have we allowed anything else um, give, have greater power over us than the Word of God as Christians? And how are we showing off God's goodness, God's might, God's power, God's God's glory, God's kindness? um towards other people um i think i think that that the point of reading these books is not just to to be amazed at the signs and wonders and the stories of the past but it really is a reminder that we are actually all called if you are on this call as a christian you are all called to preach the gospel in such a way that people give up their idols and turn to the true God. It's still very much the call of every Christian today. I'm preaching the word, you can carry a cross. You can ask the Lord for a stone to make the word real to you, whatever it takes. Um, and it doesn't have to be this scary thing that we're afraid of. What does it mean to testify? It's to give witness. Paul went to prison and all he did was tell his own story. Before Samson got that stone, he didn't even have the word. He just told his, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm imagining that if he didn't have the word because of the stone, he told his own story. He told his own story. And that was a powerful witness um, to who Jesus is. It's not who he was, who he is, you know? So that's my comment on idolatry. <laughs> Hand it back over to Robbie. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So we're right at the end, and I want to take a closing or final words from Itunuade. Okay, so um, his story um, ends. the The end of the story is is. Um, I don't know, it has two parts. So you may say it's a tragedy. Um, when, we were, when we were having our review, <laughs> we went back and forth about this. But basically what happened, he was now, um, Pong is now in, you know, in seclusion, he's by himself. And um, I mean, that was how he spent the rest of his days. So, but, I want to read here the last two paragraphs, and I think that it's very important. It says, the tragedy of Samsung Opong is that he lacked training for ministry. If he had been patient and had sat in the Sunday school and catechism classes to be taught the rudiments of reading, he would have been able to read the Bible. And he would have, this is what I was saying, he would have read of Samson and understood the power of vows. Unlike Samson of the Bible, Sapong Opong never had a second chance. 
Some gr glory and graces are so unique that if lost, they can't be regained again. But the beautiful thing, which is, you know, the, the blessing of the kind of God that we serve is this. Opong later humbled himself and returned to the church, and he died in the cover of Methodism. Now, the triumph of Opong's life was that he did not lose his soul. He still died humbled in the arms of the church. So what, what I saw there, that last sentence, what it did for me was to show the mercy of God. That in spite of everything, he made a mess of, of things at the end of the day. I mean, it's only when we get to heaven that we would know if he really finished what he was supposed to do or if he didn't. You know, but the mercy of God was that God still ensured the salvation of his soul. Which is what I got from, from this. That look, what we are doing from, for God is wonderful. It's okay. It's good. You know, but be, be, beyond what we are doing for God, God is more concerned about the salvation of our souls. Who we really are. What our relationship with him is like. So for, for Opong, that was the major lesson I got from it. That it's beyond what you are doing for the Lord. It's beyond the, the, the work of the Lord. It is more about the relationship that you have with God. And God, even if you have missed it in the work with the Lord, the mercy of God can reach you so that at least your soul is saved and we can get into heaven. Because at the end of the day, we want to spend eternity with him. And yes... Like I was saying, you know, there will still be crying in heaven. It's recorded in the Bible. Because at the end of the day, people are still going to see, I could have done this, I could have done that, you know. But beyond all that is the relationship with God, and that is the beauty of God here. That God still saved his soul. His soul was not lost. Yes, the work ended abruptly. Yes, he missed it. But God still found him. He still came back and he ended with the Lord. I think that is so beautiful. And like Shola, Oli Shola said at, the, at our review, you know, that we were saying, oh, it's such a tragedy. Robert, Robbie and I were like, oh, that we could have ended on a better, you know, with a better story and all that. But Shola actually brought it out that it wasn't so much of a tragedy. It was actually, this is a beautiful thing. And at the end of the day, this is what is this is the bottom line for every one of us, our salvation with the Lord. Wow, very beautifully summarized. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So Shola, do you have any final words in 30 seconds also? Or are you resting? Uh no, I'm not resting. Uh <laughs> oh, I, I misunderstood. <laughs> I thought this is what you're asking me. Um, 30 seconds or more, I think for me, um, I, I pretty much, I think the last thing I said was, was, most, was, was my final word, but really my, 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 my hope also is that um, we see that, 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 you know, what you said at the beginning, Robbie, that, that, that God is for us. And when I say us, I mean, Black people, Africans, that, 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 that this is not a white man's religion. And that it could never have spread as a white man's religion. God had to make himself real to us, had to make himself known to us. Um, and, and in this, and, and one of the beauties of, of Samson's story is that this is a story that you can take to people who disqualify themselves, um, who don't feel qualified. So many times we hear about people who are transformed, but before they are transformed, who were they before? They were the same men. In, in the drug dens, in the, in, in the bars, in the nightclubs, who really feel disqualified from knowing God, much less being used by him to literally transform regions. And so um, every story in here, even the most weirdest ones, <laughs> um, I think we, can, we, we all know someone who, who fits in that story and may have disqualified themselves from being called of God to do great things um and and that yeah we we don't just read this book or hear these stories we live them out um and we allow ourselves to be transformed by them 
we stand on all that they have achieved and we continue to expand the kingdom of God in Africa, in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you, Shola. So that's it. That's um, seven or so months of 14 revivalist stories of some heart-wrenching stories. We cried reading some of them. We were angry, ran away. I remember the one that I said, you know, I took a break. I was like, I can't read this anymore. This is just too painful. Uh, I criticized while reading it. I was humbled while reading it. I was pensive while reading through all kinds of emotions, but most of all, I've become a better, more informed person, more informed Christian, and more empathetic as well, because it's like I've, I've gained, my lenses have become a little clearer when I look at, when I look at people, when I look at people who are walking in ministry, when I making an assessment, because this is something that Shola sometimes uh, and I sometimes discuss. There are some people who you will look at in ministry, very evidently the power of God is on their life because they are doing signs and wonders. And we know it's not by the devil, but you look into their personal lives and you're upset with God, Lord, God, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of upset. That person cannot be doing that, cannot be representing you because they're doing this, this, and that. And that is just, no, no, no. We want to put a, a hangman's noose around their neck and hang them because their lives don't seem to match up with the what we know, what we believe we know about God. And through just reviewing this book, I think it's brought me to, and I hope that it's done something similar to you, to the place where I'm learning to look at God, have my eyes focused on God and not on people. God chooses who he will use, you know, and because he uses somebody does not mean that he, that person's lifestyle has his stamp of approval. Maybe there's a void or a vacancy. Maybe the right people refuse to be available. So he used what he would use. Lord will use a donkey. And what if he wants to continue to use that vessel the way it is um, with all of their issues that they come with? He alone knows the heart of man and the plans for that person's redemption. There's a conversation I've been having and, uh, you know, about how some people are really bad and we just honestly tell the truth. You want them gone. You want them wiped off the face. If they will just not wake up from their sleep because they're causing so much pain and hardship to millions of people. So if they're taken off the scene, it will just solve the problem. Maybe they are rapists. Maybe they are killers for hire, maybe they're druggies, you know, they sell drugs, or maybe they're, um, what do you call them, traffickers, they traffic humans for all kinds of, you, if you think about it logically, it just makes sense if they're removed from the equation, removed from the scene, then we'll have peace of mind. But then I saw in Ezekiel, God said, he started off by saying, what's this proverb you have in Israel, you know, that um, the fathers have, um, have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. I won't have that anymore. The soul that's in it will die. If you eat the sour grapes, it's your own teeth that will suffer for it. It's not your children's teeth. Let your children suffer for what they committed. Then he goes on further to say, he didn't stop there because, okay, the, you know, you get punished for your own sins. I like that. I was happy with that. that. That makes sense to me. But he didn't stop there. He goes on to say, but you know, really, it doesn't do me well when bad people die. I don't really like it. And I'm just like, how would you not like it? We all like it. We like it when bad people die. But God says he doesn't like it when bad people die. And the reason, because he doesn't like their eternal destiny. He doesn't want them to end up there. So he suffers long and his suffering, we too are suffering long for those people with the hope that they will repent. But God, on the flip side, he doesn't have a problem with Righteous people dying any day. We can be popping up and going, this is me adding my flavor to this. So please, guys, in case it's coming out like a narcissistic God, it's not that. You know, he doesn't have a problem with righteous people going because he knows they're coming to him. They're coming home. And though people here on earth will cry and all of that, but they're coming home and they're not going to want to go back. My friend Maya has had that experience and she didn't want to go back until Jesus said, no, 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 no. You have to go back, you know? So... Um, the point of what I'm saying is that God has a very different way that he looks at these things. And he calls us individually not to look at the vessels, 
but to keep our eyes on him. Keep our eyes. Don't copy what the other person is doing. Just work out your own salvation with fear and with trembling. Don't try to make excuses for other people. You know, not that you shouldn't call out sin, but don't get carried away by, by um, people. He, 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 that would derail us. And also the other point I wanted to make is what I've said before that Christianity has been in Africa from as early as the hundreds, hundreds, what do you call that? The year hundreds, the early hundreds uh, or the ninth century as they call it. it. Christianity has been in Africa since then. Christianity is not a, a white man's religion. It, it, is, it is not a white man's religion that was handed down to us or forced on us or all of, the, all of that misinformation. We should know better. Jesus had been working out the purpose of his salvation and he's used every means and all means to get it to us today. And we can celebrate. We have it in freedom. Um, God has a message for the decaying world and it is turn your heart from idolatry. This world that we are living in today is decaying, is fast decaying. God is still saying, turn your hearts away from idolatry and turn it to me, the only true God. No human being or message can substitute for God in our lives. Everybody, no matter how great, still falls short of the standard of Jesus. And Jesus says it, it is burdensome and it, um, Jesus gives us the model of how we should live. And his way is not burdensome um, uh, or unattainable. Although my friend said, Jumoke said earlier on today that she thought about it and said, she said, Jesus, I think it's a bit burdensome. I mean, if you look at it, all things considered, sometimes it can be really burdensome. <laughs> um, don't get caught up in the vessel. The message of, of the gospel was not spread through colonialism. It gained acceptance through African men and women and i see lola put a comment in the uh, put a comment in the chat she said maybe the reception is because people like to listen to their own they hear better when it is their own and that's a very valid point that's why um the gospel spread when our own people began to meet with the lord and talk to us about it we you know it made sense it made sense we could we could now relate god has been in africa the, and finally, I would like to say this one because we're struggling with it. Um, the black man is not cursed. Africans are not cursed. We are not cursed. You only empower the lie that you believe. And I think that to a large extent, we believe that there's something wrong with that. And it keeps, you know, we empower it to have control and have dominion over us. We have been having beautiful encounters with the Lord since, from ever, uh, since the beginning. You know, and our encounters are always so fervent and so beautiful, so intense. We don't go small. Um, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't go small. And um, we're no different from others. God has been using others and he also uses us. He uses us in unique ways as tailor made for our generation, our people, our audience and our makeup. Um, so that would be my summary. And don't limit yourself. Don't let anything limit you or shortchange you. Pursue the Lord with all of your heart, irrespective of who's doing what and what's happening. The Lord is for you. He is not against you. The Lord is for you. He is not against you. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would rest on this review. And I want to Thank my co-reviewers for tonight. You've done a marvelous job. I'm so grateful. Thank everybody that has held on to, this is the latest we've been. I apologize, it's the last one, but thank you for holding on. Thank you, Coach Lillian. She's always putting up a chat and is encouraging. Thank you, um, everybody. Nossa, I saw you today. Thank you for coming. I know you're a busy man. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you to anybody. God bless you. And I just pray that, Every one of us, we will have our own special, just unique encounters on this journey with God. And most importantly, that Jesus can always vouch for our hearts. <laughs> you know, any day Jesus can vouch for our hearts with him. And that, that's what's most important. Whether we do great things or we don't do great things, just let Jesus celebrate your love for him. Um, 
Thank you, everyone. So, um, DB, over to you. We have come to the end. Or should I be saying over to Tolu? Tolu, are you there to close us out? I, I, I really wish we don't come to the end. Quite honestly. I think we should be doing this as often as we can. The Christian community needs to embrace being well informed. Being well informed, it is. It is very. It, it will be very, very tragic if the source of our information is even wrong. The basis of our decision making will be warped. And for me, this is the difference between those that are born of corruptible seed and those that are born of incorruptible seed. Bible speaks of those born of corruptible seed those that are used to transactional Jesus, uh, corruptible seed. The Bible even explains it, uh, of silver and of gold. And those that are born of incorruptible seed by the word of God that lives and abides forever. Okay? And when we do this, it's because we believe the premise upon which our decision is based, is accurate. If there is anything, my involvement with the sages, with the likes of Baba, Moses, if there is anything it has done in my life, in my life, it has made my foundation authentic. That's all. It can never be taken away from me because the basis upon which most of us take our decision, the basis upon which the modern Christian rests, that particular fulcrum, that support, is not accurate. And that is what programs like this will expose. It will expose those inaccuracies, bring them to the surface because we don't like to confront them. And then sharpen us, work you know, on us. When we read these stories, when we, when, we, when we read them, they should be life-changing for us. So for me, it has been a nine months of, I mean, I, I really wish it will come to an end. Hopefully, if God leads us again, we can pick another book, another Baba's book. I have them a lot in my, in my library, and I'm not giving it to anybody. <laughs> Ravi has asked me for it many times. Uh, they are so priceless. It's, they are the most priceless of all my books in my life. And it's just because of the, the wealth of experience that we get. I really wish, I really hope that these books can be available to everybody. Uh, God bless you so much, Robin. I'm so grateful for the sacrifice you've, you've, you've made. It's a lot, you know, since March. Uh, it's a whole lot. When you picked up the challenge, I was even afraid for you. <laughs> it's a whole lot. Um, then again, what I discovered about the, the, this book and some of the things that I've done, uh, to the glory of God, uh, in order that people will know the works of the fathers of faith, um, is that in reading them, I have been truly blessed spiritually in coming in contact with these uh, documents, these manuscripts. I have been truly transformed. It has been a life-changing journey for me. And Baba made it very clear to me that anyone that gets involved in the uh, work of the genuine fathers of faith or those that have genuinely labored, somehow God uses that, you know, that contribution that you've made. God, God always uses it in, to your favor. 
spiritually, you will have some weight. You will have the weight where it matter. Okay. Uh, and, and God will bless you for doing that. If, I mean, I, I have heard of many stories of people that have committed their lives to bringing these things out in their own day that God blessed. So I believe that you reading it, you hearing it, you coming for this book review, it's going to be life-changing for you spiritually. It's going to be uplifting for you. It's going to make you identify where the true idols are because, yeah, there are idols. What Shola said was very profound. There are idols, and we cannot rubber stamp. We cannot tell God to rubber stamp us. It's not God is not a stamping machine. Okay, uh, you stand before Him. You see yourself. He exposes every deep thing inside of you, brings it out, and if you are willing, He exchanges it for His own beauty, and then you get. You keep getting better as you go on. I've been blessed by the works of the fathers. The only thing I represent on earth is Jesus through the fathers of faith that have genuinely given themselves to him. God has blessed me with that. And I am so grateful to, um, to use this forum as an opportunity for this. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not new to us that uh, in forums like this, you won't, you, won't see, you won't see the church called crowd won't find them here okay because the church called crowd would not want <laughs> things like this mm -hmm. but this is the real meat that the church should yearn for so please don't let it stop after now let us go with the flow let's do more uh it's a big challenge i also on my own path will start working on how to bring everybody together so that the prophecy can be fulfilled. Those that have uh, genuinely put themselves forward as volunteers to see this work uh, go everywhere. I will do everything to make that happen by the grace of God and God keep, keep, keep Baba for me. God keep all of the sages for me. I love them so much. I've been truly blessed by them. Um, I'm their last born. Yeah, I'm the one. D1 that they will all commit the, 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 the button to, and I, I receive it from Baba, from every, you know, it is such a blessing. I'm so truly blessed to be in this generation and to have known him. And I thank God for him. And I only pray that God will help him to do more for this generation and to be blessed in his lifetime in his lifetime so that it won't be after he's dead that all these things will be will be said thank you so much everyone uh i hate to say this we've come to an end of we've come to the end of it uh oh god i i miss this i miss this a lot a lot i miss it a lot god bless you god bless you robbie thank you so much i'm going to throw another challenge to you don't worry uh god bless you uh shola for joining Thank you for your time. Okay, good, good night, night everyone. Good night. Thank you. Shola says season two is coming. This is the end of season one. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. All right, everyone. Good.